Well, believe it or not, we are now about 100 days into Joe Biden's presidency, give or take, and I thought it would be useful to kind of pause from the news stories we talk about pretty frequently on the program and just reflect on the early stage, like the first milestone of Joe Biden's presidency. And uh, there's already so much that this is going to be difficult to kind of uh, go through. It's not going to be an exhaustive list of the pros and the cons, but I do want to talk about some of the standout things that he's done. We'll talk about the good, the bad, uh, the mixed slash complicated things, as well as the ugly. Uh, But first and foremost, starting with the good, I I think that the easiest, most obvious conclusion at this point in time is that predictably, Joe Biden is a much better president than Donald Trump. I think that most reasonable people can deduce that that is the case. Now, having said that, the bar is like below the floor, but I mean, it still matters. And it matters when it comes to issues like COVID-19, because I think it's obvious that Joe Biden has been much more capable and competent at handling the pandemic. It's not a perfect response, but is it better than Donald Trump? Absolutely. And Joe Biden gets credit for setting out to uh, do 100 million vaccinations and not only achieving that goal, but actually passing it. If Donald Trump were president, I don't know that I would be in a position to where I had already received my first vaccination in April. I don't think that this would be possible because there are numerous reports that Donald Trump had zero infrastructure built to actually distribute the vaccines. So who knows how long it would have taken to get vaccinated under Donald Trump. So Joe Biden gets credit for actually acting like an adult and doing the bare minimum. But I still don't think his response has been perfect. I think that his push to reopen schools is too hasty, and I don't agree with that. I think that, you know, him not waiving, essentially going back on his promise to immediately waive IP rights so that way smaller countries can create their own generic COVID vaccinations, that's bad. But again, so far overall, when you step back and you look at his response to COVID-19, it has been a lot better. Another thing that he gets credit for, obviously, is the Paris Climate Accord. Again, it's hard to give him a lot of credit for this because it's the bare minimum, but Donald Trump wouldn't even allow us to do the bare minimum. And any small steps we took to trying to mitigate climate change, Trump even undid that. So just to not go backwards... I think that that does matter when we're talking about climate change. Is it enough? Mm -mm, Not at all. But not going backwards is still preferable to going backwards. Not making progress is preferable to going backwards. And again, when the bar is so low, you know, I can acknowledge these things. Now, one more thing that I want to give him major credit for is in his infrastructure proposal, there's actually a provision that could end the net neutrality debate once and for all by offering funding to build up publicly owned municipal broadband alternatives. So this would not just end monopolies when it comes to the internet, but it would be a game changer. And when it comes to net neutrality, as I expected, he appointed Jessica Rosen Worsell to be the acting chair of the FCC. And he's now putting funding into municipal broadband efforts, which is really needed. So if he were able to pull this off, I'll reserve judgment to see more details about this plan. But if he were actually able to pull this off, it would be a game changer. So this is something that net neutrality activists should be proud of. But moving on to the more mixed things. Now, in this category, it's kind of the gray area category where ultimately he did something, but it was temporary or he could have done more. Um, Or, you know, he he did something uh, because he was forced to do something. Um, But in this mixed category, I I have to start off with the fourteen hundred dollar checks. Nobody should ever forget the fact that he promised $2,000 checks and he gave us $1,400 checks. Now, thank you for the $1,400. Not good enough, though. You said $2,000. I think it is uh, unforgivable that you didn't follow through with that promise. I'm sorry, but uh, I've got to keep it real. Now, also in the mixed to meh category is uh, withdrawing troops from Afghanistan. I will reserve judgment uh, because if he actually does this, he gets credit for this. And we're not talking about like reducing the troops down to an insignificant level. I'm talking about getting out, period. If he does this, he gets credit. 
Thus far, he signaled his intent to do that. I am very skeptical that he's actually going to follow through. So we'll put this in the mixed category, but we'll get to uh, foreign policy a little bit more later. Now, uh, I think that David Dayen of the American Prospect did a good job at kind of talking through some of the more complicated things about Joe Biden's legacy thus far. Quote, in response to the tragic outbreak of COVID-19 in India, Biden's team ignored calls for help for several days. Finally, National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan ended the export ban on raw materials for vaccines. Then, after weeks of prodding, he decided to share with India and the world dormant AstraZeneca vaccines that had been sitting in a warehouse in Baltimore. Also, the administration set a deadline of March 15th for an emergency temporary workplace standard for COVID-19, then shot past that date and at one point even put the rule on hold. After pushing from Senate Democrats and labor unions, finally yesterday, the Department of Labor advanced the temporary standard through the regulatory process, which means it's still not active until after the Office of Management and Budget signs off. The Biden's team's greatest legislative accomplishment, the expanded and advanced child tax credit in the American rescue plan only lasts for one year. Democrats pressured Biden to make that permanent, but he rejected that, citing the high cost, and instead will reportedly only extend it to 2025 in tomorrow's announcement. Representative Richard Neal, chair of the House Ways and Means Committee, has deviated from that script today, is reducing a family care bill that makes the CTC permanent. Also, the Biden team needed only to sign a piece of paper to increase the refugee cap and allow tens of thousands of migrants in deplorable conditions to settle in the United States. Biden promised to do it and briefed Congress, then changed his mind. Reportedly, it was his decision and left the refugees stuck on the tarmac. After tremendous pushback from all corners of the party, Biden relented, but only to say that he would set a new refugee cap by May 15th. So these are things that it's a little bit complicated, you know, because he, on one hand, he did something that was good, but if it's not going to be permanent, as it relates to the child tax credit, uh, then, I mean, you get partial credit, but you should have gone further. You know, if, if you finally uh, relented on something because you got pushed back, I mean, that's good, but it, it's complicated, right? So that's why we kind of have this in-between category. But moving on to the bad, uh, you know, this is a lot less uh, difficult to gauge whether or not he is uh, at fault or deserves credit. He's just downright bad. And of course, I'm talking about his foreign policy, which has been predictably atrocious. And in an article for Jacobin by Daniel Bessemer, he thoroughly explains how there's been zero change since he took office. The most important thing to know about the Biden administration's foreign policy so far is that it is structurally identical to the foreign policies of every U.S. president since World War II. It is, simply put, a foreign policy organized around the principle of world domination. Biden's underlings will ensure that the U.S. dollar remains the world's global reserve currency, that the U.S. armed forces retain access to the nation's approximately 750 overseas bases, and that the government continues to spend a grotesque amount on the military. The U.S. left, meanwhile, well, is in a strange position. The Bernie Sanders campaign and the success of left politicians like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, Ilhan Omar, and Rashida Tlaib have demonstrated that there's a real hunger for criticism of the status quo. Simultaneously, however, Sanders' defeat and the relative weakness of AOC, Omar, and Tlaib suggest that socialists need to step back and think through our general approach to the U.S. state and power itself. Foreign policy must be central to this effort. Even if Sanders had won the presidency, it would have have been difficult to manipulate the levers of power for anti-imperial ends, not least because we socialists don't fully understand how the actually existing American imperial state operates. The state formation is unique in world history. It is not only genuinely global, but it also diffuses power and authority through an opaque network of public institutions, multinational corporations, consultancies, and think tanks. Figuring out how to shape and work within the incredibly complex matrix will require significant intellectual work. It is a project to which the left, presently out of power, though with a hopefully bright future, should dedicate itself. Which brings us to Biden's first 100 days. So far, the new president has promised to remove all troops from Afghanistan by the 20th anniversary of the September 11th, 2001 attacks, failed to rejoin the Iran nuclear deal, returned the U.S. to the Paris Climate Agreement on Climate Change, begun to rebuild relationships with allies in Europe and Asia,
Asia and adopted an aggressive posture towards Russia and China. All told, Biden has embraced a restorationist approach to U.S. foreign policy organized around three goals, ending the U.S. intervention in Afghanistan, reestablishing domestic and international faith in U.S. leadership, the common euphemism for hegemony, and manufacturing consent for U.S. dominance both at home and abroad by raising the specter of great power competition and a new Cold War. So given what we know about the military-industrial complex, and as the article explains, it essentially it is this amorphous entity that operates semi-autonomously almost. You know, it's not necessarily surprising that Biden is so terrible on foreign policy. But having said that, though, even with all of the pressure from the military-industrial complex, he has chosen unilaterally to make terrible decisions. Him not joining the JCPOA, otherwise known as the Iran Nuclear Agreement, is unforgivable. He's backtracking on a promise, and sure, it's early, we'll have to wait and see, but this should have been an immediate priority, something that's easy to accomplish. You check it off, and that's a promise fulfilled, but he hasn't done that. And additionally, while we're on the subject of foreign policy, let's just, you know, uh, gradually move over into the ugly category, because I think we can file him choosing to bomb Syria under the ugly. Not only was that illegal under U.S. law, it was illegal under international law. Unacceptable and unforgivable, something that is going to be a stain on his record. But on top of that, while we're talking about the ugly, uh, there's absolutely no excuses when it comes to his approach related to immigration. After promising to halt all deportations within the first 100 days of his administration, he has deported more than 300,000 immigrants. Now, to be overly charitable, he did sign an executive order halting deportations for his first 100 days in office. However, a federal judge who used a Trump Justice Department era policy to shoot down that executive order changed things, right? So Biden, he could have adapted, he could have subverted that ruling, he could have postponed all of the deportations to meet this promise at a minimum. But he didn't do that. Instead, he went in the opposite direction, and guess what? Kids are still in cages. Folks are still getting deported and kids are still being caged and it gets worse than that. 500 kids are being crammed into cages meant for 32 people. And guess what? COVID is spreading rapidly. The positivity rate at at least one facility in Texas is 14%. That is insane. That is deadly. And as Jake Johnson of Common Dreams explains, rights group United We Dream warned Tuesday that unless he takes immediate steps to improve his administration's treatment of immigrants, President Joe Biden is at serious risk of repeating the destructive failures of former President Barack Obama, who deported roughly three million people during his eight years in office. Despite Biden's characterization of Obama's mass deportations as a mistake and pledge to usher in a more humane immigration system, United We Dream estimates that the administration has deported just over 300,000 people since January, largely using a Trump-era policy called Title 42. In a statement on Monday, Cynthia Garcia of United We Dream stressed that Title 42 was designed under one of the most anti-immigrant administrations in modern history. President Biden and the Department of Homeland Security must be reminded that their inaction to protect vulnerable immigrant communities seeking refuge in the United States is not only putting lives on the line, it upholds a white nationalist immigration system that seeks to expel and keep black and brown immigrants out at any cost, said Garcia, who voiced dismay at the Biden administration's deportation of vulnerable Haitians and others. According to a report released late last month by the Haitian Bridge Alliance and other advocacy groups, the Biden administration used Title 42 to deport more Haitians during its first weeks in power than the Trump administration did in all of fiscal year 2020. Now, for those of you who don't know what Title 42 is, this is what Trump used to basically uh, have the pandemic be the justification to deport lots and lots of people. So having said that, just stepping back and taking a look at Joe Biden's administration thus far at the 100 day point, give or take again, I would say that um, there's been some good. There's been a lot of really bad and ugly things, but ultimately nothing has fundamentally changed. And this is what I expected. And also this is what he promised. But obviously this is by no means an exhaustive list. This is just a lot of things that stood out to me. Having said that though, I did take the Twitter to ask people what they believed were the best and worst things 
of Joe Biden's administration, and here are their responses. Michael Solomon says that he did enjoy him tripping, uh, but to be serious, uh, you know, his uh, pending promise break from expanding Medicare might be worse. Definitely. Um, Oscar says the stimulus was the best, even if it was watered down, and the worst is increased spending on military and police during a pandemic. Absolutely. Zachary is impressed by the vaccine rollout. Um, but the ones that spring to his mind when it comes to the negatives, of course, immigration, that's what we talked about. It is a continuation of Trump's policies, and that is correct. Treating the pandemic as a serious issue, that's important to Aaron. And also the worst thing is largely running things on autopilot and standing by on important issues instead of using the power of the bully pulpit. Totally agree with that here. Another person says uh, COVID-19. And then also the worst thing is firing staffers for disclosing marijuana use. This is something that I totally forgot about because so much has happened uh, since he was inaugurated. This, you know, there's a lot. Uh, this person, I agree with them. The worst is immigration, 100%. It's awful. Another person says handling of the COVID-19. And there's quite a bit of responses, so I'll just kind of uh, scroll through them. And if you want to uh, pause the video or check out this Twitter thread, then you can, you know, see for yourself. But a lot of folks kind of say the same thing. The best thing is the vaccine rollout, which I agree with, his handling of COVID-19 and the stimulus to an extent, even if it was watered down. And a lot of folks talking about his terrible foreign policy and also his uh, stances towards immigration, uh, deferring student loans. This is actually something that is really important, but he won't say whether or not he'll cancel student debt. Yeah, and this impacted me personally because deferring my student loans that, that helps me. But whether or not he's going to cancel student debt, who knows? Um, best vaccine rollout. Worst, not doing this to Joe Manchin. Love this. Yeah, so there's a lot of really great, um, really great uh, responses here. And, you know, kind of a variety of answers here. But overall, you know, it, it's, a, it's a mixed bag, right? Joe Biden is better than Donald Trump. But that doesn't mean that he's good by any stretch of the imagination. I mean, this person says getting rid of the Muslim ban. Absolutely, that matters. But the worst, everything on foreign policy. And yeah, I mean, this is someone who is just kind of keeping the status quo as it is. So, you know, I'm not going to go through all this is a lot. I did not anticipate this many responses. Uh, but, you know, there you have it. That's that's kind of the takeaway. This isn't necessarily a comprehensive list of every single thing he's done that's good and bad. It's just the main things that stand out. But, uh, you know, sound off in the comments. Let me know what you think. And I'll, I'll be there to uh, heart some of your comments. And uh, I'll pin the best one that I see. You know. You, you, you know. <laughs> you know the, you know the thing, thing. You're getting nervous, man, man.